Um, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, yeah, so my undergraduate degree is actually in philosophy uh, with a minor in uh, business economics. I had thought about studying supply chain and logistics because this was a long time ago uh, before Amazon, and I thought chain. I mean, that's probably just going to be like working at a warehouse or something. Um, so, you know, maybe not the best decision. But um, I want to say thank you so much for having me today. Um, really well organized. I speak at a lot of different state economic development conferences, and this has amazing attendance. Uh, so you all should be really, really proud of yourselves. It tells me a lot about your community that you guys are on the same page and committed to uh, developing the community and the economy. So good for you guys. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about our company and what we do, which will kind of give a background into um, my background as well. So founded in 2010, we are a spin out of the Financial Times. So we develop software for site selection consultants, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, they are hired by companies to evaluate different locations for either expansion or relocation. Uh, we do primarily focus on attracting foreign direct investment. Um, my background is primarily in technology companies out of Silicon Valley, so I do a lot of that. Um, and again, kind of the stats that we have, um, you know, we have a lot of different clients. I manage the state of Louisiana's foreign direct investment. Um, we've done quite a bit in investment for them. And again, just having kind of the, the suite of software and database products, uh, including one called Incentives Monitor. I manage uh, that product for the U.S. We track all tax incentive deals globally. Um, so really interesting to see the programs that are out there. So if you all have any questions about tax incentives and best practices, which I know everyone just loves, um, I'm happy to share some data there. Um, spoiler alert, Oregon is a little low on the tax incentives. All right. So talking a little bit about trends and company funding. So I've used this database a lot, especially when I was on the EDO side, um, but now on the lead generation for other economic development organizations. You might not be able to see everything. Uh, it's a little bit slow. But generally, the idea is that the color represents the amount of funding. So the deeper the color, the more of the funding. And the size representing the number of deals. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about CB Insights is it doesn't really track public companies so much. Um, what it really is tracking more of those uh, VC-backed, um, private, privately funded companies, which is interesting because, you know, it's great to get the Amazons and the Microsofts. But realistically, you know, coming from a market like Phoenix, we didn't get a lot of those. And we didn't, um, and a lot of the communities I represent now, they're just not going to be in the game for that. We don't have the labor pool. Um, we don't have that kind of talent in general. Logistically, it might be a little bit difficult. Um, the other thing that's interesting about uh, CB Insights is you can track funding rounds. So if you're kind of familiar with the life cycle of uh, companies getting funded, you know, there's like the angel stage where they get an angel investor. Then it goes down to an A round, a B round, a C round, and then so forth. So really, as smaller markets, it's better to concentrate on kind of tracking what companies are getting B round of fundings. Uh, if it's a, you know, company that does software as a service, they might be looking for a sales office or customer service to grow. Whereas if it's a company that maybe does subscription boxes, something like that, um, they're looking to take distribution or manufacturing in-house. So um, you can see the internet is the biggest one. I want to focus on business products and services because um, I did note that that and financial came up quite a bit for this region in terms of past investment. Um, and then from the business services, you'll see consulting and outsourcing is by far the most funded and has the most number of financing deals. Okay, so what do trends in company funding look like? And what does it mean when a company has a consulting and outsourcing product or service? Uh, so a couple examples are, you know, when we think about consulting and outsourcing, we think of e &Y, we think of PwC, Deloitte. These really expensive consultants um, that are now producing uh, people who have left the company, those companies tend to have 20% turnover annually. It's not a pleasure to work for them. 
for a lot of people, depending. So I was just like caught myself. I was like, oh my gosh, I hope no one from PwC is in the audience. <laughs> Um, so, uh, one thing that they would go to these consulting companies for um, was information, um, so basically just data, right? I, I need data to understand how to grow my business, what to do, and they charge, you know, very high prices. So you have these things like, and also just how is the information presented? Uh, so you have companies like Looker and Tableau where they are importing different types of information and you can customize the entire interface. Um, so consultants are using this, but also, you know, companies are taking some of these people that have left the, the big for the consulting firms and are hiring them and they can do everything in-house using systems like this that you once needed a massive consulting firm with multiple departments to do. So that's been kind of interesting. Um, the other thing is expertise. Again, you go to one of those big firms because you know, you have something that's going on in your company, or we should we grow this service or product line? Should we scale back? What should we do? Uh, well, a lot of times, you know, you don't need somebody to come in and do a whole deep dive on your business. So some of the newer companies are GLG, Third Bridge, um, and what they'll do is maybe they just connect you to an expert in the field for a conversation. It doesn't have to be this really expensive, multiple hour fee thing. It can just be you know, a phone call with somebody who's been in your position to just kind of either validate or give you some things to look at. All right, and the last thing is really you know, just the consulting matrix updated. And so it used to be, okay, let me look at Let's say I've got five different product lines and services, you know, like Amazon. It's not just delivery, right? They do everything. So you look at, okay, what is my market share? What is the market growth? You have this whole matrix. It's a thing. You have spend all of this money on consultants to give you an analysis. Again, there is software that does this. Oops. Is that right? Okay. It's like... I got to, all right. All right, so the other thing is financial services. Um, trends here are investment firms and funds, insurance. We're seeing a lot in lending. If every single time you go to buy something, it says, it's like now kind of like the home shopping network thing where it's, do you want to buy this for 50 bucks or do you want to make eight payments of whatever amount? So we're seeing that a lot now. It's actually really interesting because millennials are, um, they don't like having credit cards. Maybe it's a hangover from the recession or what have you, but a lot of them actually prefer these kind of multi-payment systems rather than actually taking on what they would consider like traditional credit. Companies like this, um, Robinhood, um, how many people here listen to podcasts? Anyone? Yes, right? I'm a podcast nut. And the fun thing about podcasts is you get to listen to the same ads over and over and over again. I do not have a Casper mattress, but it is always in the back of my mind. So Robinhood is really interesting. You'll start to hear their ads. They're kind of rolling it out and a lot through podcasts. So Robinhood is actually an app um, and you can do, uh, you can trade stocks on the app. When traditionally you'd have to go to a Morgan Stanley, pay a bunch of money per trade, Robinhood, you don't have to pay anything for a trade. The other thing you don't have to do is um, they will give you stock for free when you start. They have like a whole sampling. You can get Apple, you can get Ford. They will give you stock for free. I don't know how that works. I don't know how they monetize this. It's probably they're just taking everyone's information, but it's working for them. They're doing very well. Um, Green Sky is interesting. This is specifically for home improvement projects, which has been a growing industry. So basically, you go online, you figure out what your home improvement project is going to be, they'll estimate out what it's going to cost, and they will create um, lending financing opportunities. Um, the other one I have highlighted here is Oscar. Um, initially, it was Oscar Health. Um, this was a client I actually worked with. They're out of New York. Um, so they uh, came into origination after Obamacare, um, really helping people understand how to navigate the affordable care system um, so that they could, you know, really be that interface that's a little bit friendlier. Um, also interesting on this, the person who founded it was Josh Kushner, so the other Kushner. So little different tracks that they took. And they have really fun marketing. I mean, it's like if the health insurance is good enough for a bear, I mean, how could, how could it not be good for me? So um, they're, they're really fun. And they have expanded, I think, to several states. I'm not sure if they're in Oregon yet. 
Okay, so those are kind of like the trends of what's happening. We're also going to talk about what companies are looking for. How do you go after those companies? And then how do you actually attract the talent that those companies want? Um, how many people have seen this movie, Searching? Oh, they needed to do a better job marketing. Okay, this movie actually has nothing to do with site selection. I just really liked it. And it's only 90 minutes, which to find a movie that's enjoyable that is 90 minutes or less is really hard. Um, but it does have a lot of cool screen stuff. Anyway, check it out. I don't get a kickback or anything. Okay. What are companies looking for? So these are going to be all companies. Your big companies, your small companies, everybody you know, is kind of after this same thing. So you have a uh, labor cost, right? And so you, know, you all as a region are, are pretty competitive in terms of, of labor cost, whereas you look at some other markets and it's starting to get really, really expensive. You know, there's also uh, the quality of labor, uh, so that's something that comes into um, consideration as well. Proximity to customers, this is especially if you are looking at retail um, or if you are dependent upon, um, let's say, distribution. Um, you know, that's going to be that's going to be a big driver. Distribution centers often don't get tax incentives, and the reality is, is because they have to go or they have to go to service customers. Um, labor retention. You know, that's another that's another interesting thing. You see a lot of markets who are talking about San Francisco and the Bay Area. There is not a loyalty to companies there. People will go, they'll get money for training, they'll do all of this, and then they leave. Um, Salt Lake City is actually kind of interesting because um, anecdotally, from what I understand from multiple companies, it is really hard to find labor because the unemployment rate is so low. But when you get them, they are super loyal. Um, real estate, again, you know, does the, does the office space, does the warehouse, how many docks does it have? You need to be able to have real estate. We'll talk about a little bit how that's different for tech companies in just a bit. Um, incentives, this is a much bigger deal for larger companies. Um, you know, they're going to be looking at corporate income tax credits. They're going to want them to be refer, uh, refundable. They're going to want them to be transferable. Um, you know, withholding tax incentives. Uh, there's a lot of different things um, out there. I know Moss and Adams does a lot of this work. So it's, you know, it's interesting. For a lot of companies that are smaller and are tech companies, they don't really need incentives. It's not going to be a major consideration of their move, which also makes them a really good target. I come from a market that doesn't have a lot of tax incentives, and so finding companies that aren't going to ask for a lot of tax incentives is a, a beneficial relationship. Um, the other thing is the, you know, it's really hard to get corporate income tax credits when you don't have any corporate income yet because you are somehow worth a billion dollars, but you haven't made any money. Um, quality of life, uh, again, this is big for all companies now. It doesn't, it doesn't matter um, the size of the company, if it's a tech company. Maybe on like distribution and light manufacturing, they don't care as much. But even on you know, manufacturing deals where it's welders, like, they care about quality of life. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit, too. Okay. Um, so one of the things that our firm does is we, um, we track all projects globally and um, within the U.S. So anytime a company moves, anytime Amazon mo expands, you're like, stop using the Amazon. Anytime Walmart expands to uh, a new location, um, we, we record that. We have a very large team of people that do this, and this is what they do. We also look at all of the, the press releases, and oftentimes, you know, there's an announcement, uh, there's a quote from the economic development group, there's a, co a quote from whoever the person is inside the company. They often say, this is why we moved. So we took a look at this, and one of the things I thought might be interesting to do, since we're talking more about what technology companies are looking for or you know, even the differences in the last 10 years. So you can see here proximity to customers, um, number one. I mean, that's going to be a huge driver of a lot of moves. You have to have proximity to customers if it's inherent to your business model. Um, the other thing is market growth potential. Um, this is, you know, had a bit of a drop, and it's interesting to see why that might be. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with, because we don't have as many tangible things, 
you're selling everywhere, so it's maybe not as much of an issue. Um, so we're not 100% sure, but that might be something to consider. Um, but this is where it gets interesting. I mean, skilled workforce is qu quoted 10% more at the time now. And I, I think that's really something to consider is as technology has moved, manufacturing jobs are more advanced. Um, there's a lot of outsourcing for things like legal Zoom or basic legal services. You know, now if I'm going to hire somebody and I'm going to have a, a real, um, you know, successful operation, I need people who are more advanced than just, you know, doing the same forms again and again. Um, I'm going to go below first technology and innovation. Um, you know, it might be university partnerships or community college partnerships. It might be because there's a clustering of knowledge um, or skills or innovation and research and development that's happening around something that relates to their industry. Um, but the last one I want to talk about is the regulations and business climate. Um, it's, this is kind of interesting. You know, I met with the... Um, <coughs> the policy person for Airbnb uh, about a year ago, and she was telling me that while um, you don't need to have Airbnb in your market for them to consider moving there, they of course want you to be really friendly to gig economies because why do they want to put their operation in a place that doesn't overall support the nature of, of what they're doing? Um, and so it was really interesting to hear Colleen talk about the proclamations and how friendly you guys want to be to business and regulatory environment. Even if it's not something that affects their business, um, it is something that, that they want regardless. It's kind of a, a good faith thought for the future, regardless of whether they need to take advantage of it. Okay, I just kind of pulled, and these are everything that I've pulled on the last slide on this slide, I just want to make a note, is to say, you know, quote unquote, high quality operations. So I took out distribution, I took out retail. I mean, those are, you know, obviously jobs, good jobs. Um, but when we're talking about, um, you know, something that's going to be, require kind of that next level talent, we're looking more at business services, R&D. I include sales centers in there as well. It's a great target for tech companies. Um, they have a position, which nobody's really known what bucket to put it into, customer service or sales, but it's called customer success. So, you know, let's say you um, use Square, right, and they make your website. So you'll call and you'll ask about using Square or you're having a little bit of an issue with it. And so it's, they want these people now who do everything and who can handle everything. So they'll hire you. You can answer basic questions. But then they want you to be the type of person that can upsell them. It's kind of like when you call AT&T or Verizon or whoever your provider is now. And you say, oh, I just need to buy an extra data plan for the month. And then it's like a 15-minute sales thing. So everybody's kind of moving toward that as well. Um, so that's included in, included in um, this as well, even though it's kind of quasi-customer service. Obviously, most things are going to Washington. Oregon's number two. Idaho, I'm very high on Boise right now. They've been doing really great stuff. Montana continues to kind of uh, be a little bit lower. Oregon has a really high average capex. I went back and looked at that. It just seems to be a lot of uh, Intel investment because it is, you know, very capital investment heavy. Um, you know, there is there hasn't been a lot recently in this market, um, but I have seen you know a general trend upward, you know, statewide. Um, so in terms of what things are going to the Pacific Northwest in order, um, and I can send the actual breakdown, but we're seeing business services, sales, marketing, and support, um, and then it goes down from there. Um, but, you know, manufacturing, design, development, and testing, sales, business services, you're going to see more of those projects. Obviously, headquarters projects are fewer and farther between, um, even though coming from the economic development organization side, all of our stakeholders were like, why aren't we getting Apple? Why aren't all these headquarters moving here? It's just those projects don't come up a lot. And if they are, it's oftentimes just threatening to leave. Okay. So what are companies looking for? Um, so these are, we're going to talk about like some unique characteristics of fast growth companies. So again, this is, you know, Ida lead generation team that's specifically focused on tech. We specifically looked at the Bay Area. Um, venture capitalists are getting much more involved in these decisions. They're going to give you funding. They're going to, you know, give you a management team to operate. Um, they're going to really put in some processes 
Um, but the other thing they're going to do is they're going to look at you and say, why do you have your sales team here in San Francisco? Like, this doesn't make any sense. Or why do you have your customer success people and you're paying them 75 grand a year? They're still all living four people to an apartment. And we really think you should consider exploring other locations. Um, so, you know, these are kind of some of these smaller companies that aren't looking to go to a Seattle or an Atlanta or a New York. Um, but the first thing to understand is really the lack of experience. So, you know, these companies are small, they're growing really fast, they can't hire people quickly enough, and typically the people who are in charge have not a lot of experience. So, you know, the thought process from the CEO who's really mainly done engineering is, oh, well, we need to hire people. That's human resources, right? Like, we'll just put the human resources person in charge of looking at the expansion. Well, the human resources person isn't going to know how to talk about operating costs. They're not going to know how to talk about regulatory environment. They're just going to want to know how many people do you have and what's the average wage. So they're missing a lot of things. And so it's your job as economic developers or people who are supporting um, you know, the ED organizations themselves with information to really help arm them with what they need to know because you're acting as the site selection consultant for these companies. They do not typically go out and hire them unless they've massively screwed up and they have to go back and fix it. Um, culture is really important. Um, so this is going to be the culture of a community. Um, they're going to want, also I'm going to include uh, amenities under that as well. Uh, so now we see more and more economic development organizations putting into their response for proposals, um, how many coffee shops do we have? How many craft breweries do we have? Uh, and it's really interesting to see how that's becoming a bigger and bigger driver. Um, how many you know, miles of bike lane do we have? These are things that um, speak to, and they might not be hard quantitative things, but they're speaking to the overall culture and feeling of a community. The culture thing is also really interesting because um, I see more and more tech companies that they don't want to go to Phoenix, Salt Lake, Portland, Denver, Austin, because it's been done. Everybody's there. They're going to be a small fish in a bigger pond, and it just doesn't make sense for them. So everybody's kind of looking to see what those next markets are, which is why I mentioned Boise, because we're having a lot more people ask about it. The other thing that's interesting about Boise is that I kind of akin to this area is just the outdoor lifestyle. I mean, you know, you guys have a lot of things going for you in terms of golf courses. Um, but the other thing to consider is a lot of younger people don't play golf anymore. And so what do they do? They mountain bike and they do regular hiking and trail running and all of those things. And so being able to take people out of San Francisco, but kind of move that culture and lifestyle and livability uh, to another market is really, really important. Um, herd mentality. Um, this is interesting because while we have people looking to new markets, um, the Boise thing was overnight. Like, it was nobody asked about Boise, and then everybody asked about Boise. I, I feel like they're on, like, a group chat or something like that, and they just pick a city. Um, same thing happened with Detroit for a while, and then everybody realized that was not a good idea. So, um, but, Boise come, but Boise comes up, and I think that's also one of the reasons that, you know, all of a sudden everybody was going to Salt Lake City. Everybody was going to Phoenix. And part of that is if you can get a company, and they come, and they have a great experience, then they're able to tell the story of, like, look, this company came here. They're scaled. They're really happy. They're feeling like a big fish, and they're getting the love. And so that's also part of the herd mentality. Um, politics, I mean, this is something that uh, tech companies really, really care about. Uh, the number of times I was in a meeting when I was in Phoenix and they were like, we don't like your immigration stance. We are very concerned about gender discrimination. How are you addressing that? The last thing that we want is move to your city and see the city council or the state legislature pass some bill that really does not look progressive and matching to our views. So, I mean, wherever your politics lie, it's something that you have to consider because it is the predominant feeling of those companies. Um, also under politics, which is really kind of more under culture, diversity. 
a lot of these companies have internal diversity requirements. Um, so it's interesting, like Salt Lake's always kind of been a tough place to go. Um, it's interesting, Goldman Sachs did a very large uh, location in Salt Lake City. Um, part of that is they have amazing uh, language diversity. People speak a lot of different languages, but they don't have a lot of ethnic diversity. And so they actually let anybody from any Goldman Sachs, most 90% of positions say, if you want to move to Salt Lake, you can move to Salt Lake because they need the diversity that will come from other markets. Um, flexibility. So flexibility, um, that has a lot to do with just the nature of technology companies. I mean, kind of... Um, what was mentioned about talent, where it's not this linear growth. It's the same thing for technology companies. I mean, it's the same thing for a lot of companies, but it's, it's a little more frequent with tech companies. So a lot of times, you know, don't be afraid of the smaller companies that are saying, hey, I'm looking at your area. Um, do you have a co-working space? Do you have a place where I can do interview? Um, a lot of times that's where the community colleges come in. And having the flexibility to get them the workforce they need, but also the space, um, you know, if they're a little larger, having first right of refusal on another building that's in close proximity so that if they need to grow right away, they can grow right away. Um, and the last thing I'll say on this uh, are is know every market. So this kind of goes back to them not having a lot of experience. And so they don't know every market. So they're throwing out cities and you kind of have to know what you've heard about those cities or what challenges they might find in those other cities. Um, so, for example, uh, when I had, you know, companies that were interested in Austin or Portland, and whether this is true or not, it's just, you know, you've heard. You've heard that they don't love all these new businesses coming in. You don't love that they have all of these San Francisco people coming in, raising uh, housing costs, all of that. Um, you know, Denver, I've heard the infrastructure stinks and now labor costs are getting so high because labor is so tight. People used to say about Phoenix, Scottsdale, oh, I heard everyone you pulled from ASU, they just end up showing up hungover every day. I don't know if that's true, but that was our personal negative thing. Um, so just something to consider is being able to speak to other markets is a good thing and kind of say, you know, positioning yourself against that. Um, you know, with Boise, I used to say, yeah, it's really cool. I love Boise. Who doesn't love Boise? The problem is, is like, you guys are probably going to grow like 5x in the next two years because you're so amazing. And there's no way the labor pool is going to be able to accommodate you in Boise. Everyone thinks they're going to grow super fast. So it's just confidence, confidence. It's important. Okay, um, these are just a couple of examples. We also get indicators of um, companies that are considering expansion. And I just wanted to give a couple of examples. Um, so what happens is, you know, as we're looking at press releases, it's not just for companies who have moved, but it's also companies that have said, hey, we actually um, have received funding recently, and that funding is specifically to expand. Um, and so these are a couple of ones that, you know, are interesting um, but are kind of on the, on the newer industry side. So, you know, recycling, waste to ethanol. Um, we've seen a lot of co-working spaces become interested in doing traditional expansion um, consideration mode, and so that's come up quite a bit. Okay, how do you attract high-quality operations? Um, so for this, it's really about the talent attraction. So we know that these companies, they want a culture, they want a vibe, they want everybody to be cool that they're looking at. Um, and so, you know, how do you get these people? Well, actually some interesting, some economic development organizations will have booths at South by Southwest. And as people go around, you just, Scottsdale used to do that. Um, trying to think, there are a couple of other communities that would do that as well across the country where they would go and say, hey, you know, we're really cool. We have the same thing that everybody here in Austin has. Let me talk to you about it. Although they had this really bad campaign called, um, I can say that, they, that it was called Swipe Right on Scottsdale. It was supposed to be like a play on Tinder. Oof. They got me like, they were like, hey, have a Swipe Right Scottsdale shirt. And I was like, hmm, I will be sure to wear this frequently. Um... 
so, uh, oh, let me go back here. Okay, so actually before we get to the talent attraction, I forgot I had this in here. So our company, you know, you mentioned we've gotten a billion dollars in investment. Um, part of that is knowing what we call combat indicators. So it's really um, what is an indicator that a company is looking to expand. So um, obviously, if they've announced a current strategy plan or expansion plan, that's a good one. Um, that doesn't always happen. Uh, we do a lot of FDIC. You'll see some things in here about international, but um, it's really interesting to um, understand you know, what's going on in their industry, if there are other competitors in their industry who are moving locations. Um, you know, clearly, there's something happening there. Global footprint, you know, while I talk a lot about going after smaller companies, sometimes it's a, it can be a really fast process because they're growing so quickly and they're usually a little late in the game by the time they consider moving. Um, but it can also be stop and start. Um, but the size of the company is always a big indicator. Most of the companies that are doing an expansion have expanded before. Um, R&D spending, uh, that's another good one. Um, exports or contracts in the location, again, you know, that's really understanding whether it be um, investment following trade um, or back and forth commerce, interstate, um, but also just general supply chains. Um, and if they've ever done any investment. So this kind of goes back to your business retention and expansion. Know the companies in your region, talk to them all the time, see what they need, be proactive, uh, just don't call them when they have a problem. And then when we do find these companies, some of this you can kind of do on your own. Um, with tech companies, it actually is pretty easy to do on your own. They're usually, they've never heard of economic development organizations or cities or anyone calling them and your information is free and they're just so, that's so exciting and they're so nice. Uh, when I call into companies in New York, I do not get the same response. <laughs> so Bay Area is a lot, Bay Area is a lot friendlier. Um, but really taking a multifaceted approach. I will say the other thing on this is, you know, we primarily contract with states, regionals, country level, um, development banks. And, you know, really for a lot of proactive outreach, you should be sitting down with your regional group and have a strategy about it, but it should really only be one group that is doing the outward proactive lead generation. You can go on with them on sales missions, you can provide them with information, know how to uniquely position your community, um, but it should be one uh, organization that's going out. Um, and then the company versus talent attraction approach. So this is kind of at the company level, talking about the talent level. Okay, so before we play this video, I just wanna give a little bit of a background. I used to do a lot of work with um, Holland. So Holland, like five years ago, did this whole series of talent attraction videos, and they're still, to this day, my favorite. Um, so just giving you an idea of this is what they did in terms of marketing to give a people an idea of the cultural vibe feeling of the Netherlands. Um, so if you can put up the video, that would be great. Oh, hello. You know, people ask me all the time, Pim, what do you mean Holland is the original cool? Well, <laughs> Dutch. <laughs> but if that's not enough, we've gathered some of the best minds in Holland to explore this question. And we discovered the answer is just too big for one video. Episode 1. We will examine the question, can cool be taught? We have selected one American at random who was quite surprised to learn that he won a free trip to Holland. Got it. Booking a flight was easy, and using KLM's meet and seat feature, I was able to see information about other passengers on the flight, and put him next to a very handsome fellow, in economy comfort. And we will teach him Holland cool. American. Do you consider yourself cool? Yeah, good. Me neither. Let's get started. We begin with our greatest city, Amsterdam. The birthplace of Original Cool, where we have been making progressive art, architecture and design for over 400 years. But to truly understand Holland, you must learn to master the bicycle. We Dutch are able to ride it everywhere we go. Because of our 20,000 miles of bike paths and lanes in Holland, bikers always have to ride away. I will teach you everything there is to know about Cool. First, the theory, then the skills. There are over 100 varieties of artisanal Dutch cheese. 
You will know every one of them. Out of boarding class. Wrong. Younger boarding class. Try again. You will know how to enjoy real beer. Dutch. How to eat locally. When to stop and smell the flowers. How to partake in our great tradition of facial hair. How to navigate the canal. How to party. You will be cool. Holland, the original cool. We gotta work on that. On the next episode of Holland, the original cool, the original cool experience. That was actually done in partnership with their tourism office, which when it comes to talent attraction, it's really smart to partner up with whoever is doing your, your tourism um, or convention work because it's the same message for a lot of the young talent where they don't really care about what is the regulatory cost and what are the real estate costs and all of those things. They want to know, do I want to live there? Is that a cool place? I mean, especially with labor being so tight right now, people often chase place before they chase company. So, um, you know, this obviously did not even mention a single company. Um, if you do go to their investment agency's website, they do have videos that mention the companies and they're a little bit of a snooze. But uh, this one was really primarily for, for talent attraction and they now have like five like episodes of this. So, you know. And also I kind of loved it because it was not super nice to Americans, but I also wasn't mad at it. I mean, it was, it, it was that's a careful line. They did a, they did a good job. Um, so the other one I want to talk about real quickly, this one's a lot shorter. So obviously Holland Oh my gosh, I would love to have that budget and spend that on a video and have it go viral. And of course, you know, stakeholders and citizens are always like, well, can't we just have a video that goes viral, right? Um, that's really that's really hard to do. Um, and it's also really expensive. So the interesting thing about this one, it is Dallas, um, which I think was able to put it out through more channels, but the video itself um, was amazing relative to anything they had done before. And this is what we're talking about, leverage, leverage what or who you have. Um, so of course Dallas has Mark Cuban, who's a big personality, loves Dallas, um, wants more people to come to Mavs games, so perfect for him. Um, so it's, it's you know, really understanding, all right, who do I have that's here that would be a good spokesperson that could go through certain channels? Um, so if we can play that one, it's, a, it's, it's shorter. Getting in the door and getting started, unlike a lot of communities, a lot of, a lot of states, Dallas, you just go to work. If you're, if you're young and you're getting ready to start a business, no matter where you live in the world, I'd say come to Dallas because it's friction free, it's really quick, simple and easy to start a company. There, there's just a different work ethic here. You're going to find every ethnicity, you're going to find every gender, you're going to find every orientation. If I'm taking a tour with a recent college graduate, I'm going to show them how much fun this town is. I'm going to take them to McKinney Avenue. I'm going to take them to Bishop Arts, you know, the American Airlines Center where there's always events. Whatever it is, we all come together. And that's what makes us unique. There's an old saying that if you want to predict the future, invent it. And that's what we do in Dallas, Texas. Every single day, there's incredible entrepreneurs looking to invent the future. Great companies start here. Great companies grow here. Great investments happen here. There's no shortage of opportunities in Dallas, Texas. That's who we are. Okay, that was like a little more straight and to the point. Um, the interesting thing that was done by this, it was all done by interns and community college students. Um, I've seen a lot of communities, um, especially if they're membership-based private public regional organizations or city organizations or chambers, um, where they will get together and all of the different member organizations will offer in-kind membership to get help with marketing. Um, and so, you know, a lot of this is just trying to get any lift that you can. It's hard to measure the ROI, um, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit when we close out. But um, just really interesting to see what they were able to do um, with a limited budget from the video perspective. 
Um, obviously, Mark Cuban got something out of that being in front of the stadium and or the arena and the wearing a basketball shirt. And so, quid pro quo. That's okay. Um, so the other ways to leverage talent, industry, um, expertise, and then social media. Uh, so one of the things that's interesting about that is, I'm trying to think of some of the different markets, but there are several markets that they are smaller. They do not have celebrities like Mark Cuban who live in their market, but they have celebrities who are from that market that have social media followers. And so it's something to think about, you know, possibly engaging them and giving a little love back to their hometown. The other thing would be uh, industry expertise. So if you have people, you know, like an economist who is, you know, has a following and people are looking toward that person for, you know, real information, um, asking them to, you know, if they would be willing to help support the community if it's in their interest as well. Um, so something to think about. Um, Kansas City, I'm a big fan of Kansas City's talent attraction. It's They've done they've done a great job at like the the larger level and then more focused in terms of tactics. Um, so this uh, website they have a website that's just called Think KC, and you can click on any of those pictures and it tells you a little bit about who that person is, what they do in Kansas City, what they're involved in. Um, which kind of goes back to the whole idea of if you're looking to go somewhere, you kind of want to know who your friends would be. Who would you hang out with? Even if you know some people there, you want to get a vibe of what that would look like. I'm probably not cool enough to be friends with half of these people, but just knowing that they're there makes me feel cooler. So it's definitely something to, to consider, just really bringing it down to leveraging even people you have who aren't famous but are doing cool things, especially when you look at what you guys have in terms of the Rogue Valley and everything around that, um, something, to, something to consider. Um, creating a one-stop shop, this goes back to, you know, we're talking about how you do lead generation for business expansion, how do you do uh, talent attraction. These are a lot of different messages, really making sure you bring it back to one place. Um, you know, it, I would say go ahead and Google um, how do I move my business to Medford, how do I move my business to Ashland, and see what comes up. Um, if there isn't something there, you need to make sure there's something there, and you need to make sure that it's one organization and all of the communities are going up to support it. Um, so you might have talent attraction messaging uh, through that stop or site, but you're also going to have things like um, Intern BR, which is Baton Rouge, they have this, you know, as part of the, the larger economic development site and really is just helping companies find interns and, and doing a matchmaking. Um, so it's interesting to see that, you know, they are working on employment from the intern and student side, but they're also working on it from the employer side. And it makes perfect sense because Baton Rouge has LSU but they don't have a lot of Fortune 500 companies. And they ha so for them, it's always a challenge of how do we retain these students? You know, Southern Oregon University, I don't know what their retention rate is, but how do you take these people who have gone to college here, love it, love their friends, are probably going to have some friends who stay on, how do you create opportunities that gives them ties to the community? Um, Kansas City, so the interesting thing about this, that was kind of like from a broader talent attraction perspective, maybe more of the millennial. Um, but they also have, the first thing I wanted to notice I thought was interesting about this graphic is that automatically I'm thinking, oh, if I'm looking at businesses, New York, LA, DC, Kansas City is right up there. And it's aspirational. Um, now, obviously, if you're like Amarillo, Texas, probably not a good idea. But you can maybe put yourself up to, um, you know, Houston or Lubbock or Waco or some of these places that have, you know, more people. Um, and then they also create a concierge program. So one of the things that's hard in communities where you don't have a lot of corporate headquarters, um, and I work with a lot of these, is when they're looking to hire, when your big companies are looking to hire CFOs or they're looking to hire 
um, software talent, things that are highly in demand, they're really, these are people who are going to be a big spend for them in terms of salary and benefits, overall compensation. But, you know, from the employee side, well, why do I want to go there if for some reason I move my family and it doesn't work out? Well, shoot, that that's not good. So what Kansas City does, because they they, they've done this for Sprint. Um, I'm trying to think about some of the other companies. Basically, they had a guy who was looking to be a CFO. And he's like, if it doesn't work out, I don't know that I want to stay in Kansas City. And also, this is a really good job. This would definitely be a step up in my career. But I have a family, and I'm at this level now. And my kid's in high school, and he plays baseball. And he's really good. And you know, So they did a whole tour. They found out what he likes to do for hobbies. They connected him to all of those hobbies. They found the best, um, you know, baseball teams. I guess they're not, like, school-related anymore. They're all, I don't know, it's all fancy now. So it's, like, intramural or whatever. So they took him around to those organizations, and so the kid was able to then be an advocate for moving as well because, unlike in his own community where he was doing really well, people were actually trying to sell him. Um, also, big part of this, spousal positions as well. You know, if someone's moving here and they're going to move their family, really you need to be proactive about finding their, their spouse a, a position because that's going to be a huge decision maker um, in their thought process. Or at least getting them tied into organizations, philanthropic interests, what do you care about? Um, do we have something that relates to that? Um, and then the other thing is um, t on talent attraction. I know you all have some of the services that are around this. Um, this is interesting. It's uh, Northeast Ohio, which is Cleveland, but it also has all of these other surrounding communities that have really been hit by um, kind of Rust Belt issues, which they're trying to rebrand as the Trust Belt. Let's see how that goes. So um, <laughs> education and information for small business operations, um, growth opportunities. I mean, this is really... What we're seeing more and more is that any service that you're providing, a job board or, you know, helping small businesses, anything like that, you have to be looking at it from the employee end and you have to be proactively advertising it to the businesses as well. And you have to learn from these businesses what are the skills that they're not getting, what do they need, how do you develop training around that. How do you find people who maybe have transferable skills, make them aware of workforce development opportunities, and then get them on a career path to these companies that, that need people? And then, of course, trying to do it as quickly as possible. Um, oh, so the other thing on this is going to be know your focus. Um, you know, what's really hard is you go to a lot of communities and you say, well, what's your specialty? I'm trying to help you develop an economic development strategy. Typically, we try to do things on a sector industry focus. We don't want to be all over the place, you know, the traditional rifle shot approach. Um, and they'll say, oh, well, we have, a, we have a biomedical corridor, and we're really good at manufacturing, and we would love tech companies, and we want this, and we want that. And, I mean, you can't be everything to everyone, even huge cities, unless you're like, Chicago, New York, LA, San Francisco, Atlanta, even those places have, uh, have specialties and industry focus that really you know, makes more sense for them, you know, comparative advantage, right? And so um, part of that is really knowing your focus, double down, in, down on that as well. And then it also helps you um, save some dollars as well. If you're just focusing on uh, what you know you're really good at and you can grow and you have a labor supply of and you have infrastructure to support, uh, it makes a lot more sense to spend your money on marketing that than marketing everything. Um, and then the last thing um, I'll talk about, um, I think one other slide after this, is Calgary. I love Calgary's talent attraction. Um, they have Calgary be part of the energy. So Calgary traditionally is known for one thing and one thing only, which is petroleum, energy products, um, anything like that. And so, but they're trying to get talent attraction and a lot of young millennials, if you're going to have a diversified economy, don't want to go to just, you know, an energy um, dependent uh, economy. You know, they're going to want to be able to do some other things that they can get in and enjoy longevity of a career path. Uh, so they've done a really good job of saying, hey, you think about us as energy, come be part of the energy. And then they talk about 
what energy means in all these different ways. So all of a sudden you're thinking energy and now you're thinking energy of a city is pretty clever. I think it's done a really good job. They've, they've absolutely been amazing. They also have a lot of great funds to pour into workforce development and entrepreneur supports so that, you know, that always helps. Um, so again, spending more on those who are receptive to your message. Um, and again, people and companies, especially site selectors, know that no city is everything to everyone. Um, so the last thing would really be, you know, what gets measured gets managed. I'm a big fan of creating metrics and KPIs that are going to support your goals and inform you on what you should stop spending money on and what you should spend more money on. Um, so really starting with background data, a lot of markets um, before you just start something, I mean, just creating a brand campaign and saying, well, this city did a really cool job. Let's just kind of take what they did. You know, you need to do focus groups. All these people do focus groups. They understand their constituents. They talk to people who have just moved here, who have been here for a long time and grown their communities or grown their careers in that community. And they say, why are you here? What do you like it? Have you thought about moving? When you thought about moving, why did you think about moving? Um, and then, you know, talking to companies about how they've been successful, uh, what they hear from their employees, um, what do they have to spend or offer on their own in terms of talent attraction to hire people, getting all of that background information, and then measuring your success. Talent attraction is really difficult because it's hard to really tie efforts right back into um, you know, what it, the spend has been on, on the branding. So it's, you know, important to say, okay, you know, before we do anything, we need to have a website. We need to have that one-stop shop that people will land on. And we will see, you know, how much time do they spend on it? What other parts of the site do they go on to? Is it more talent that's looking at things on the website? Or is it actually, you know, more companies trying to understand basic economic data facts? Um, and also, you know, really what are you getting in terms of if you have a job board or your community has a job board, are you getting more looks there? Uh, all of those things can be correlated back to your efforts and the money that's been spent on that. So um, there are some other sources online that, that have more about how to measure your success around talent attraction efforts, but I still think it's a newer area in terms of really trying to, to measure success in a more quantitative way. Um, and so that's really all I have for you today. I wanted to stop a little bit early, one, because I know you probably have questions, and two, because you're probably ready for a drink after hearing about economics all day. Um, so any questions? Right. And I think that's great. It's the largest group of population in the States yeah. right now. However, we often overlook baby boomers, which is the right. second largest. So what can you comment on for attracting the incredible value of experience and decades that acquiring talent, as we so sterilely put it, right. into communities to bring that wealth of knowledge into a community? Can you comment on, on that? Yeah, no, absolutely. It is very annoying to me how it's like so millennial focused. Um, I think but part of that is, you know, and it's so silly too because people don't spend that long at companies anymore. They just don't. They don't spend that much time at one employer. They don't stay in the same career path even. Um, but there is this thought that I'm going to make this investment. Companies have to spend so much on training, human resources, um, that they want to make sure that they're getting that investment back. And I think that there's also a misunderstanding that um, you know, baby boomers don't have the ability to have a long career trajectory. Um, you know, my mom's 78 and she still works because she loves it, right? And so, but she also makes her own schedule now, right? And that kind of goes back to what you were saying about baby boomers is you have these people that have been in the field, they've seen things that are tried, they've seen things that are failed, they've adapted to technology, and now they're really at a place where maybe they just want to take on jobs that really make sense for, you know, something that can be flexible to them. So I think, you know, as we look at millennials and we're trying to create opportunities for them to scale and grow their career, I think what's interesting about baby boomers is creating opportunities where it isn't maybe a traditional work schedule, uh, where they can, you know, start doing that, but then eventually get to a point where they've they're really able to use their expertise in a more consultative 
uh, method. So I, I think, you know, if companies really, you know, and that's also a good alternative to what we were talking about earlier in terms of hiring consultants and the expense of consultants when you have a lot of great talent um, around. And, you know, I mean, that's even something that economic developers can do. Uh, if you are surveying, uh, you know, your constituents and understanding where there is expertise, and then you're also talking to companies, there might be an opportunity to plug them in together. So, I, I mean, I think that baby boomers are totally underutilized. It's just this concept of, you know, I'm putting money in and am I going to get my, my return? Um, so something I will also say, I notice you guys do have um, kind of an uptick in terms of uh, retirees moving to Southern Oregon, which I can imagine it's amazing lifestyle, um, and that healthcare in general has been been going strong. So I'm sure we'll continue to see that as well. Anything else? All right. Thank you all for having me. I really appreciate it.